Welcome to the IISS Japan Tier Program's inaugural session of the Economic Security Webinar Series. My name is Mariko Tagashi, Research Fellow for Japanese Security and Defense Policy at the IISS. Today, we are delighted to welcome Japan's Minister for Economic Security, His Excellency Kobayashi Takayuki, to speak on Japan's economic security strategy. The session will begin with an introduction from Robert Ward, the Japan Chair and Director of Geoeconomic and Strategy at the IISS, followed by a presentation by Minister Kobayashi. A discussion with Minister Kobayashi and Bill Emmett and a 15-minute Q&A session will follow. Bill is Chairman of the Trustees at the IISS and Chairman of the Japan Society UK. We are offering simultaneous interpretation in English and Japanese for this webinar. Please select your language of choice from the interpretation tab at the bottom of your screen. For the Q&A session, please type your questions into the Q&A tab also found at the bottom of your screen. Please be noted that your name and your affili affiliation will be disclosed along with your question. With that, I'd like to ask Robert in Tokyo for an introduction. Over to you, Robert. Thank you, Mariko. And thank you again to our audience. Uh, which is an international one with uh, representation across the hemispheres uh, for joining us today for this important session. The global uh, geopolitical and economic environment has become more volatile than at any time in recent decades. Great power competition is intensifying and threatening globalization as we knew it. The COVID-19 pandemic has left behind significant economic and political dislocation in many countries. And now Russia's invasion of Ukraine as Japan's Prime Minister Kishida has said a number of times, is shaking the global rules-based order. Against this background, it is therefore not surprising that economic security has become an increasingly important part of government policy in many countries. Japan in particular, though, has been a leading innovator in the field of economic security policy in recent years, both in terms of conceptualizing policy frameworks and developing a whole-of-government approach to policy thinking. In April 2020, for example, the Japanese government added an economic division to Japan's National Security Secretariat. And in October 2021, Prime Minister Kishida created a new cabinet level minister for economic security, tasked with, among other things, piloting the passage of economic security legislation through Japan's parliament. With all this in mind, we're delighted to host economic security minister Kobayashi Takayuki to discuss the priorities and direction of Japan's strategy and thinking in this area. Prior to his current appointment, Minister Kobayashi had held multiple roles, including as Parliamentary Vice Minister of Defense in Abe Shinzo's second administration. He joined the Ministry of Finance in 1999, going on to serve at the Embassy of Japan in Washington DC in, in 2007, and returning to Japan to win his first seat in the House of Representatives in 2012. Minister, thank you very much for sparing the time to be with us today. Congratulations too on the successful passage through Parliament of the Economic Security Promotion Bill. Please, the floor is now yours. And thank you for inviting me to this prestigious IISS webinar today. Uh, I'm Takayuki Kobayashi, uh, Minister in charge of the economic security under the current uh, Kishida administration. Uh, I'm also in charge of the uh, science and technology policy, as well as the space policy. And uh, uh, as I mentioned uh, right before now, uh, prime uh, economic security is uh, uh, one of the uh, top priority agenda of, of Prime Minister Kishida. Uh, so he created a new post uh, in the cabinet uh, last October. Uh, I'm the, uh, definitely I'm the first Minister of Economic Security in Japan, and uh, uh, I think perhaps the first minister in the world. Uh, I've never seen my specific counterpart in other countries, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, we will be followed by the uh, other countries. So uh, anyway, uh, yesterday, uh, as uh, uh, Robert San uh, mentioned before now, uh, Economic Security Promotion Act was uh, enacted in the Diet 
uh, I recognize that uh, we have taken a, a first important step uh, in ensuring the uh, safety of our nation and our uh, people from the uh, economic front. So uh, today, uh, I'm looking forward to the uh, dialogue with uh, many participants in this uh, webinar. And uh, I'm a little bit nervous because the, uh, uh, I see uh, Mr. Ichita Yamamoto, uh, who is a uh, governor of Gunma Prefecture. Uh, he's uh, one of the uh, Japanese famous uh, politicians who uh, I have uh, most uh, respected. But uh, anyway, uh, as a cabinet minister, uh, I would like to uh, be careful about the, uh, the accuracy of my remarks. So uh, let me use the uh, simultaneous interpretation from now on. So first of all, I would like to speak, of course, about economic security today, but I have been a politician now for 10 years, and in this decade, looking at how we can make Japan a country which leads the world, this has been really at the, the core, the heart of my political activities in this decade. And for Japan to become a country which can lead the world, we, of course, need to increase the state capacity of Japan. So what do we mean when we talk about this state capacity? What I think is at the core of this is looking at economy in order to make a more wealthy and abundant society and also security in order to protect the lives and livelihoods of the people. I think that these are the two different wheels of the car that we need to have functioning together at the same time. And so when we support, of course, or look at what supports economic security, it is innovation and it is also education and human resources nurturing as well. When we look at what is at the core, the, the foundation of this state capacity and look at this economic security, I think, well, Economics, the economy and security are issues which cannot be separated. Until now, perhaps they were looked at as, or there was a trend to see them as two independent fields, economy and security. But we are now in an era where this cannot be separated anymore. If we take, for example, technology, looking at GPS or internet technology and so on, many of these were born from military research and are now being used for civil purposes, civil use. However, in addition to that, things which are used, uh, technology for civil use, such as, for example, semiconductors or quantum technology is now in an era where this is also can potentially be used for military purposes as well. This technology is indeed something which has the possibility to shift the different you know, situation of the states. If we look at, for example, the struggle over hegemony between the United States and China, this is connected in this element as well. Therefore, for Japan, we are looking at how we can have a further increase in our technological capacity as well. Uh, for the country. In addition to this as well, when we look at the issue of the supply chain and its vulnerabilities which have come to light under the COVID-19 pandemic here in Japan, of course, masks disappeared, medical gowns disappeared from the hospitals, the healthcare frontline. Also looking at the supply chain for semiconductors, which are needed for so many parts of our everyday lives are also under threat as well. We look at the situation in Ukraine as well well being very difficult, tense at the moment. And this is also adding, for example, looking at energy such as natural gas or also looking at different uh, metal resources such as palladium and so on as well are also being discussed uh, quite a lot these days. When we look at digitalization and so-called DX now as well, of course, this is something which is uh, very positive, but it also leads to the increased risk of cyber attacks. And also there is an increased importance in the data maintenance, uh, data control management, and so on as well. In order to protect the lives and livelihoods of the people, we need to be able to respond to these diverse fields as well. Until now, this had been approached from traditional security approaches such as diplomacy or defense. However, not only or we cannot be limited to these, but we need to look at from the economic perspective how we can be protecting the lives and livelihoods of the people. This approach is necessary now. And in that regard, the new legislation here in Japan, and particularly looking at uh, there was different uh, revisions of the national security laws, for example, uh, with 
within the NSC, looking at until now, it had been just the diplomacy and defense policies being made clear within that. But now economic policy has been added as a, as a clear category within this as well, showing that for Japan, within the concept of security, this needs to be supported from the three perspectives of diplomacy, defense, and also the economy. In addition to this, the Kishida cabinet has for the first time created the ministerial post uh, for economic uh, policy, as I mean, economic security, as I mentioned as well. I recently went to the United States, but even in our ally, the US, there is not a direct counterpart to this same position as well. And I believe throughout the world as well, there is not actually a minister specifically for economic security in other countries in the world, as far as my understanding. And this is really why I think that our position, our stance as Japan to prioritize this is something that we can really push to the fore even more and appeal to the international community about its significance. So what is economic security? To say in one word, it is looking at how we can ensure the national interests from the economic perspective. So when we talk about what these national interests are, well, first of all, the center, the core of this is, of course, looking at the sovereignty and independence of the state and protecting the lives of the national citizens. I think this is the most important point. And what we can say in addition to this is looking at through economic growth, how we can have even further economic priori uh, prosperity being realized. And the third point when we're talking about national interest is looking at fundamental values and rules and how we can uh, protect and maintain the international order under these. These three points are together what I consider as the national interest, and these are to be protected through economic security. Within uh, proceeding in policies relating to economic security, what is the most important, I believe, is to look at our country, Japan's, having our fundamental way of thinking, our concept being uh, put forward. Kishida, Prime Minister Kishida has, within his new uh, security pol uh, policies now being developed, as he has stated, within this, looking at, under these new policies, what kind of basic concept, basic way of thinking in regards to economic security will be positioned. This is something which needs to be considered as part of this process. And within this, I believe as a very fundamental concept, what, or there are several points which I would like to prioritize. One of these is looking at the ensuring of autonomy. This is meaning understanding our country's weaknesses, our country's vulnerabilities, and looking at how we can overcome them. The second point is looking at in what areas we can be superior to other countries, have more capacity and so on, and look at how Japan can become a, a vital presence uh, in, within the international community. So looking at how Japan's strengths can be recognized and enhanced. This is the second point. And so after overcoming the weaknesses and enhancing our strengths to look at how we can strengthen Japan's position within the international community, how this can be more enhanced, and how the international order and rules can be formed also in accordance with our national interests and how we can take an active role in this as Japan. And in addition to these points, looking at, of course, there are many different approaches and angles from which we need to appro uh, approach economic security. In addition to this, there is, of course, the importance of having having actual growth of the economy, also the gathering analysis and also uh, sec securing of information, having strategic promotions, and also having a strong uh, regime for the purpose of this as well, including also human resources, uh, capacity building and development as well. A strategic combination of these, I believe, is what is going to enable the strengthening and enhancing of our economic security policy as Japan. I would like to mention some focal areas. One is uh, understanding and uh, overcoming vulnerabilities, as mentioned, uh, in Japan. Uh, currently, there are several critical infrastructure, energy for one. IT another is another, finance, distribution, or uh, 
healthcare as well. In various uh, industry uh, sectors, uh, risk scenarios uh, would be uh, established uh, to identify vulnerabilities and measures. Uh, will be implemented, should be implemented uh, with uh, priorities. This is uh, something a state should do as a given, but uh, in Japan, not enough is done in that respect. So therefore, various diverse uh, risks should be analyzed to understand uh, what measures are required when the risks are made visible. One of which is uh, enhancing resilience of the supply chain in whatever in whatever situation. Uh, it is important not to be over-dependent on other uh, countries and to the extent possible uh, to sustain uh, people's uh, lives and livelihoods uh, through the country's own will and strength. That is one of the most important uh, factors. At the same time, another important factor uh, is about comp the competitive edge of Japan and the es essentiality of Japan uh, in the international uh, community. Various technologies uh, will further advance among other uh, areas. In what area, in what area should or would Japan uh, compete? Uh, and this determination is quite difficult. But uh, to understand uh, Japan's uh, competencies and to strengthen its competencies to be uh, competitive, to, to gain a competitive edge over other countries so that Japan is considered to be essential in the international society. So the expansion or enhancement of competencies done strategically is important, particularly in the area of cutting-edge uh, technology. Developing cutting-edge uh, technology uh, once developed should not be allowed uh, to shift to other uh, countries as well. So preventing uh, leaking leakage of cutting-edge technology is another important uh, factor uh, since I assumed office in October uh, last uh, year. Uh, policy uh, pieces have been put in place uh, one after another. The recent bill that was passed uh, focuses on cross-cutting issues and issues that require a legislation uh, with urgency. Therefore, uh, that is the nature of the uh, bill which was passed uh, just yesterday during the ordinary uh, session of the Diet. Uh, if you could uh, project the slide about the four uh, pillars of the uh, bill, one of which, or rather two of which, are support uh, measures. The rest, the other two, are more regulatory uh, in nature. In terms of uh, the support policies, that is uh, building resilient, building a resilient supply chain, and the third one, public-private uh, cooperation system for cutting-edge uh, technology. That those two are support uh, policies, and the remaining uh, two, one of which is reliability of safety and reliability of critical infrastructures and the non-disclosure system for patents. Uh, two, those two are more regulatory in nature. The four uh, cornerstones were deliberated in the Diet and passed uh, subsequently. The positioning of this bill, if I may address that as well, the media uh, reports uh, quite often that uh, this bill is defensive uh, in uh, nature. I adamantly uh, deny that, reject that argument. Of course, there are some defensive uh, parts, but for example, growing cutting-edge, developing cutting-edge technology through a public-private partnership is more offensive, much more offensive in nature, building Japan's competence. And in terms of uh, building a resilient supply chain, uh, is a way uh, to provide alternatives uh, for uh, Japan, but at the same time, once an alternative goods, alternative goods can be development, uh, this becomes a competency vis-a-vis -vis other countries as well. In other words, the defense becomes offense. That is another aspect of the bill. And one more point, uh, as emphasized during the uh, diet deliberation, uh, this is this bill is an economic 
Economic security bill is short, but not just the entire, not the entire economic security. It's the first step, first important step towards establishing economic security. But there are other uh, outstanding issues as well. A national uh, security policy includes economic security and how economic security is positioned as part of the national security uh, should be uh, considered and identified uh, to address other outstanding issues. Another point uh, mentioned in the media is that the bill is uh, purely regulatory. That is not true at all. Economic activities are free uh, to do. Innovation must be open in this era. A single company or a single country in order to uh, create a new value, in order to enable innovation, no uh, country or no company can go to it alone. So economic activities, academic endeavors and innovation must be uh, free and open and therefore no, there should be no excessive regulations and there should be foreseeability guaranteed as well by reducing uh, corporate uh, burden burdens at the uh, same, bur corporate burden at the same time. So that is the uh, position based on which uh, public lives and livelihoods must be uh, protected, whatever the situation may uh, come from an economic security perspective. That is my uh, mission as a Minister of Economic Security. Thank you very much, Minister, for that uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, some some highlights for me. I think um, I think you are the first globally the first minister of economic security. We are looking to see if there are any others in uh, anywhere, but we can't find any yet. So I think you're right in making that uh, point. Um, uh, it, the importance, uh, it, I think, very important. You raised um, the the fact that economy and security can't be separated. I'm sure we'll be coming back to that. Um, you mentioned the flow of technology from the uh, civilian sphere to the mili military sphere. That's obviously very important strategically. I think you, you highlighted in your comments uh, the breadth uh, that economic security covers now, the breadth of areas. Um, I was taken by your, uh, your reference to fundamental values and rules uh, as well, which I'm sure um, uh, we were coming back to as well. Um, also, you made the very strong point, and I, I think we, we shall get this in some questions, about the bill not being defensive. You're very clear about that, but I'm sure our, our audience will be interested in hearing more about that. Uh, very importantly as well, and I think we'll come back to this in questions, you mentioned the importance of maintaining growth, economic growth, absolutely right for resilience, of course. Uh, and finally, what I think is a very interesting str strategic concept from Japan, uh, that of strategic ind indispensability. Um, uh, and again, I, I'm sure we'll be coming more back to that in the future, in the question the Q&A session. Um, I'd now like to uh, invite Bill Emmett, uh, our discussant today, to make his comments. Uh, Bill will be known to uh, many of you. Uh, Bill is currently chair of the IISS Trustees. Also, he's chair of the UK Japan Society. Um, and he was, from 1993 to 2006, uh, editor-in-chief of The Economist newspaper. Uh, Bill has also written some 15 books, uh, many of which have been on Japan, and some of which are in Japanese. Uh, so without more ado, Bill, over to you, please. Well, thank you very, very much, Robert. It's a great pleasure to be part of this very important dis discussion. And I thank also Minister Kobayashi for your very, very thought-provoking and, and uh, an excellent presentation and for your achievement in getting the bill through uh, the, both houses of the Diet. Um, I'm just going to make five uh, observations that I hope will um, help uh, fuel uh, an active discussion. My first observation is that while the context of the many is in many people's minds around economic security may well be the war in Ukraine and Russia-China partnerships and technological competition, I think it's important to remember that the most recent major act of the use of economic measures in pursuit of supposed national security uh, directives was by the United States, the imposition of tariffs on steel and aluminium being produced in countries that are allies of the United States, Japan, the European Union, the UK. 
and those tariffs have only just been reduced. And I think we have to remember that, that that was a very recent imposition by the Trump administration of these tariffs on, on national security grounds to be able to start to think through how we're going to reconcile our different security strategies between allied countries uh, and also how we will how other countries will respond to our measures uh, whether they are seen as offensive or defensive because the second point i would like to uh, offer is to say that while at first thought it often feels as if uh, economic security is best provided by domestic suppliers and by domestic capacity and certainly the building of state capacity must be a very important component of economic security another recent experience so that of the coronavirus pandemic of the last two years has shown us that in some ways true security required access to the best technology wherever wherever it may come from no country was truly secure if it could not get access to the Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca vaccines, uh, and could not thereby protect the safety um, of its people. So that suggests that an area of thought and discussion is that the, one of the challenges of economic security uh, strategy is how to best harness globalization, that access to the best technology, while at the same time managing the risks. My third point is that um, I think it's a reality in all countries, in all the world, in all economic history, that no mechanism for government intervention has ever been introduced without being quickly exploited by special interests of one kind or another. A key challenge always when the state is acting and intervening and in, whether in a proactive or a regulatory manner is to manage this role of special interests. And I think a discussion of how, to, how we think through how, how Japan is going to do that um, is I think an important uh, point here. Fourth observation is that of course to a large extent the desire to introduce economic security legislation will be identified as being driven essentially by China and by fears of technological competition with China, fears of retaliation using economic means by China as happened over rare earths um, uh, following uh, previous security disputes fears of dependencies uh, uh, on China. So one may say in a positive way that the introduction of such economic security measures and strategies are signal an end to what could be described as a naive policy towards um, uh, China and those technological uh, issues. But on the other hand, one has to ask, are we prepared for the frictions that this may cause with China and how are those frictions themselves uh, going to be managed? And the final point, which comes back partly to my observation about America's national security uh, measures under the Trump administration, is that I think a key challenge with economic security, especially as more countries around the world follow Japan's example by appointing a minister for economic security and establishing economic security as a central part of national security thinking is how with like-minded countries these strategies can be coordinated uh, it has i know it, it has been stated that the measures that japan will use will not be it will not be done if they are in some way um, in contradiction to internationally accepted rules that is perhaps something that is easier said than implemented. Uh, I think it'll be an important question to ask the degree, the way in which many of the regulatory measures 
many of the of the of the of the operationalizing of this economic security strategy how they fit with for example agreements under the cptpp um, and uh, other um, other such international agreements how that is going to be handled which leads one to wonder do we particularly meet between as i say like-minded countries allies do we need an economic security equivalent an organizational structure by which we deliberately between like-minded countries reconcile our economic security strategies perhaps the modern equivalent of the cocom system during the cold war which managed the exports export or, or indeed sought to prevent the export of sensitive technologies to the soviet union is there an organization begging to be constructed to manage these economic security measures i'll stop there those are my five observations thank you uh bill and uh, thank you again minister kawashi for your uh for your comments uh, i'm sure this has given our audience uh, a lot of material for their for their questions so please uh, cogitate um uh, while i continue to give some uh, logistics um, we're going to open up the floor now to uh, questions from the audience, so please uh, do type them into the uh, Q&A section. Uh, I understand we've already had quite a steady stream of questions uh, coming in, so please uh, do keep them coming in and we'll, we'll answer, we'll get you to ask them where we can. Uh, but when you do ask your question, please um, state your affiliation too, so we know where you're coming from. But before I uh, turn to the audience for questions, I'd like to take the Chair's privilege to ask um, the first question, and, and, and Bill, obviously, to, to answer um, as after the Minister, uh, please. Um, the new uh, legislation does Im imply significantly closer relations between government and business. I think uh, Bill, uh, Bill alluded to this, and, and this goes to your point, Minister, about uh, the importance of growth. Uh, this closer relations uh, is an inevitable part of economic security, given what you said about uh, about how economic and national security are, are, are so closely aligned. But how do you ensure that this doesn't mean a return to the old style state industrial strategy? Uh, that's one part of the question. And the second part is, where do you see the biggest challenges uh, for business in implementing the provisions of the, uh, of the law? Thank you very much. First of all, in regards to economic security and the relations or partnership between the government and business, what kind of influence it will have on this? As I mentioned previously, in order to proceed with economic security policies, what is as the precondition of this is, of course, having a free economic activities for businesses being guaranteed. This is, of course, coming as a given, looking at, for example, how to make sure that this is as much as possible ensured, while at the same time, the business operators, the burden on them can be reduced as much as possible as well. Of course, this is something which connects to the concept of how we protect the lives and livelihoods of the people, and this is uh, you know, part and parcel of that as part of the government's stance. Therefore, as was briefly mentioned before, for as well, looking at well, looking at the government intervening in order. To, well, it is not a situation of the government intervening to protect vented or existing interests. So, looking at, for example, the supply chain, looking at for what the government has specified as important materials and so on. It is not a situation where the government will be giving orders for companies to make particular moves or strengthenings and so on. It will be recognizing and valuing uh, the autonomy of the businesses and the government providing support for businesses in this regard as well. And looking at for, well, to ensure that the government does not make unnecessary intervention, it is also necessary to have various rules set in place and decided from now. These are not going to be decided unilaterally by the government, but also including the different uh, experts' advice and so on within this project to ensure that the free economic activities of businesses uh, can be guaranteed. And Bill, would you like to add a few words? Sir? Well, I, um, I think this is going to be a very uh, difficult task. I mean, one question is whether the, the collaboration, which, as the minister says, is most cl clear when it's about offering support to certain sectors, 
whether this is um, a collaboration that's limited to Japanese companies or whether this takes an international character, which perhaps is, will be in contradiction with many people's notion of, of it, but would reduce the problem um, of the creation of monopoly rents and, and of the creation of, 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 of uh, barriers. But then if, on the other hand, Prime Minister Kishida came to London last week, he used two memorable phrases, one, invest in Kishida, the second was Japan is a buy. So will Japan be a buy if there are a lot of regula regulatory restrictions, some of which might affect foreign investment? So I suppose those would be my observations that among the many things that you will have to deal with, Minister, those are two, even two more. I, I had one more question, actually, which, I, which I'm sort of slightly burning to ask you. Um, the universe of uh, economic securities is shifting and expanding. Um, before the pandemic, few, few of us have thought of health, for example, as an economic issue, economic security issue. And now with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, of course, energy security has become more urgent, particularly for uh, energy poor Japan. I thought uh, the Prime Minister's comment on, on, on nuclear power was, was interesting in, in, in London, of course. Um, the current legislation is necessarily, therefore, a, a snapshot of economic security at a particular time. Um, where do you see scope for um, expan uh, expansion uh, of, of the remit of the law? Where, where, where are sort of areas that you're also looking at? First, let me uh, address the issue of whether domestic companies are the only recipients of support or not, government support or not. The answer is no, uh, it's not just domestic companies subject to government uh, support. That is not the nature of the framework. Bill mentioned uh, how about keeping pace with international uh, systems. A WTO and other uh, global uh, rules are the basis of the Economic Security uh, Act in Japan as well, whether it may be an international non-Japanese enterprise, uh, if they are considered to be essential to enhancing, strengthening uh, the resilience of the uh, supply chain, of course, uh, those companies would be subject to, so within the, will fall within the scope of the government uh, support as well. Second point about uh, Japan is a buy, invest in Kishida, uh, so those were uh, raised in the context of economic security as well. In that respect, uh, the economic security uh, policy is not in contradiction to economic growth, rather uh, it propels economic growth in Japan. There are two points uh, in that respect, in that context. First of all, let's take uh, the vulnerability of uh, supply chain to be redressed. Uh, if there is an incident of some sort, economic uh, growth, if economic growth is negatively affected, that negative impact uh, must be uh, reduced so that the country is more resilient. That is one of the goals of the Economic Security Act. So economic growth uh, must be, must be secured and the economic security act is a premise for that. Secondly, in relation to investments, as mentioned in terms of cutting edge technology, advancement development, uh, this will be done, push through public part, private partnership for quantum, AI, bio, uh, space, and uh, marine. So cutting edge uh, technologies in those uh, areas uh, would be, uh, would encourage uh, foreign direct investment as well during the Kishida administration. The ki ki during the Kishida administration, economic growth is one of the cornerstones, as announced. And third point, uh, in response to Robert, in terms of uh, economic growth, uh, Rather, in terms of the expansion of the economic security, how, what is their reach? Whether it may be uh, food or energy, those are traditional economic security issues. Uh, there is knowledge built in those areas. Uh, those are important in in the context of uh, economic security. Now, healthcare and technology, cutting edge technology is developing. Uh, 
it's been developed rapidly, uh, how to keep pace with uh, technology development are also critical focal areas as well. At, as mentioned at the beginning, economic security uh, is to ensure um, national interests from an economic uh, standpoint. And the premise to that is included in the economic security. So automatically, the area scope of economic security is defined as well. Thank you for that full, uh, that, that, those full answers, Minister. Um, we're going to move now to the uh, questions from the audience. Uh, and we've got one. The first one is from uh, David Atkinson who's chairman and CEO of Konishi Decorative Arts and Crafts Company Limited, and he's also a visiting a professor at Nara Prefectural University and has done a lot of work on productivity, uh, and his question uh, relates uh, to that. Um, uh, and the question goes, national economic security often entails the identification of risks and strategies to respond to those risks, which may include diversification of supply chains to reduce geographic and other risks. There is always a danger of this important strategy being used by vested interests to protect uncompetitive domestic interests or to secure government funding for uncompetitive enterprises, which would have a negative impact on the competitiveness of Japanese industry and reduce innovation uh, and enterprise in industry too. Uh, what measures does the government envisage uh, needing to take to strike an efficient balance between security and competitiveness? Thank you for this question. And in regards to the concerns raised to this, I would like to say that you do not need to have a concern about these points. For example, looking at the issue of the strengthening of the supply chain or looking at what materials will be included in part of this policy as well. Of course, this will look at, for example, industries which are somewhat fading or looking at how to pr protest vested interests. It is not for the purpose of this. And they're looking at having uh, strong rules will be put in place from now to ensure that it is not serving to have this danger of uncompetitive enterprises or vested interests and so on. So I think that these concerns raised are not necessary. And did you have any, anything to add, Bill? Uh, well, I suppose the only thing I'd add would be to say that I can absolutely see that that's not the intention. Um, I think that it's legitimate, though, to worry that it might be what happens. Um, because partly because this strategy will endure through successive governments and successive ministers and successive economic growth and recession cycles. And so it is historical experience tells us that uh, in, in such environments, um, uncompetitive industries or sectors look for any opportunity they can find. <laughs> um, so that I think that it's it's something that uh, absolutely, while it's not in your intentions, it's something that the, the system is going to have to guard against. Thank you, Bill. Um, if I can add in regards to that, of course, this is something, if we're just looking at materials uh, and so on as well, uh, and goods, sorry, looking at support for Japan supporting all of the goods. Of course, we don't have the capacity to support for all forms of goods, all categories and kinds of goods. So therefore, looking at when there is a time when the supply is in danger, from the perspective of how to protect the lives and economic activities of the people, the social activities of the people. So this will be really looking at those particular goods which have a very direct uh, potential impact on this as well, to ensure that there is not an over-reliance on other countries, and so therefore define these particular important goods and looking at not only the overdependence on other countries as well, but in the future, looking at areas where there may be a risk of overdependence in the future, including new technology as well, looking at these also being included as part of the targets to be considered. And so we will be creating concrete rules in regards to this uh, so that we can indeed deal with these concerns uh, that have been raised to ensure that they we're not inviting these to be a risk and ensure that this can be protected. Thank you. Um, next question comes from uh, Dr. Maria Shagina, who is our incoming uh, fellow for at the IISS for, for sanctions, standards, and strategy. Um, and Mar uh, Maria has a question on uh, the e EU-Japan joint statement uh, pointing to energy collaboration amid, amid tight energy markets and in light of the sanctions on Russia. 
Um, what is Japan's plan to phase out imports of Russian fossil fuels? Uh, and what are the points of collaboration between the EU and Japan, given that both countries are energy dependent, or both uh, countries and the EU uh, as an organization are dependent on energy dependent on Russia? To begin with, with respect to uh, Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine, this is a non-provoked, unprovoked uh, uh, factor uh, to change the national order. Uh, our country has used the strongest words to denounce uh, such uh, behavior, such action. Uh, Japan is taking the most possible uh, measures uh, with the US and EU and other allies uh, to uh, take uh, definitive uh, actions against uh, Russia. And there is no change, no, no reason to change that position for the time being. So the suspension of a ban on uh, crude oil uh, export, exports uh, as a phased approach is a very stringent measure that Japan can possibly possibly uh, take, uh, but Japan will continue to respond in such a manner by keeping pace, working with the other allies. But separating Russia in terms of the energy, overarching energy policy, there are different circumstances that countries must uh, consider. The energy uh, industry is, the, uh, is an infrastructure, essentially, of other energies. So stable energy supply must be secured one way or the other. And to be considered by the respective uh, states at their own initiative to seek out the best uh, solutions. Uh, nuclear energy was raised uh, previously. Japan is raising the issue of S plus three, uh, stable sustainability uh, and security as well to achieve all in terms of uh, safety. This must be maximized so that uh, nuclear uh, power plants uh, would restart operations as well. By combining uh, such uh, policies, energy, stable supply of energy uh, can be ensured. Thank you. Um, in the interests of time, I'm going to move to the next question. We've got about 13 minutes before we have to, uh, we have to end this webinar. Um, I'm going to go next to uh, Kawakami Yasuhiro uh, from the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, Senior Research Fellow. Uh, and Kawakami-san uh, is talking about uh, the outflow of advanced uh, technology, which you uh, indicated was important to prevent. Um, and Kawakami-san asks, what are your thoughts on the human outflow of advanced knowledge and experience, for example, the intellectual outflow of uh, retired people uh, with, uh, with advanced knowledge and experience? But of course, there will be others, for example, uh, students coming to here to study and, 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 and so on. Thank you very much. This issue of the outflow, the human outflow and so on, intellectual outflow, I believe, is a very important issue. As was mentioned, for example, looking at the outflow of retired people with very uh, advanced and uh, expert knowledge and so on, looking at how they can remain in Japan and have their skills and their expertise utilized is something which is a very important challenge, but also a very difficult challenge at the same time. Personally, I think that, first of all, looking at people with this kind of expertise and technical knowledge and so on, well, first of all, where are they? Their existence, I think, is something which we as the government have uh, the need to have a clearer understanding of where indeed they are located and active. Japan, looking at its wanting to continue its uh, research and development and so on and create an environment uh, conducive for that is very important. And my personal opinion in regards to this is also, for example, example, as the state looking at how we can have very, you know, challenging, very uh, projects as well. But when these are being promoted, for example, people, either retired people or young people as well with particular skills and expertise, taking the challenge of joining these projects and having the government, the state, create the environment that they can do that is, I think, one solution. Um, the next question comes from uh, Ian Metcalf uh, of the Embassy of Canada uh, to Japan. Uh, and Ian Metcalf uh, asks, 
How will the Japanese government offset the administrative burden on companies engaged in procuring critical uh, commodities? Won't the administrative requirements act as a disincentive to procure uh, critical commodities? Uh, and he also asks, uh, can you comment on the scope of commodities that will be designated as critical and subject to supply chain security requirements? Now, in terms of the uh, resilience of the supply chain, that's not the only uh, factor. In terms of uh, the uh, bill, uh, Dan Leng, the Japan Business Organization, uh, the managers' organization, and SME organizations, as well as labor unions, were engaged in a discussion in the process of uh, drafting uh, the bill. In terms of uh, corporate uh, burdens, uh, the intent is to reduce uh, company burdens to the extent uh, possible so that the burden is not excessive. That is the nature of the bill, the, the law as well. In terms of uh, it's strengthening the resilience of the supply chain. This is not a regular. This is not a regulation. This is a support measure. Uh, companies uh, operate at their own initiative and will remain autonomous. The autonomy would be respected in terms of uh, special goods or, or in critical uh, goods, as defined by uh, the uh, government. The companies have the freedom uh, to uh, volunteer or take the initiative uh, to participate participate in that program, and once they do, they will be subject to government support. So no excessive burden there. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from uh, Theodore Beale, and uh, after the minister asks, I'd like to bring Bill in here, because it speaks to something that um, Bill was talking about. Uh, and uh, Theodore Beale asks, uh, I wonder if Ms. Minister Kobashi could comment further on the uh, economic security strategy having offensive or positive elements. Could he speak on the role of international partnerships to facilitate that, either bilateral or leveraging security-minded groups like the Quad? Thank you very much for that question. First, of all the Japanese economic security and its strategy, as was mentioned before as well, is not something which is only, well, of course, looking at the economic power, economic means, and so on of Japan, not looking at trying to you know, force some kind of changes in uh, actions and so on of other countries. Rather, it is looking at how to reduce and how to minimize our weaknesses and enhance our strengths in order to make a stronger position of Japan within the international community and contribute to international uh, rule and international orders. And therefore, it is, of course, looking at, well, it is focusing on strengthening our initiatives, our activities as Japan. Of course, it's not possible to do all of this only with Japan independently. Looking at partnerships with other like-minded countries, other countries is very important as well. As Bill mentioned earlier, Earlier. For example, the CPTPP, for example, the Quad, and these different international partnerships and structures, I believe, or we believe, are extremely important. And so, for example, in regards to the Quad, looking at how to strengthen the supply chain issues and how to have further coordination is one of the, indeed, important points within the discussions of the Quad. However, for Japan, what is important for us is to identify and analyze our strengths and weaknesses and to ensure that uh, this can indeed be coordination be done in a very full way. And I think this is really what will lead to true coordination and partnership. Therefore, within the new creation of this economic security strategy, we are first of all looking at what Japan uh, and should have as its core way of thinking as the first and most important step, and then looking at what kind of meaningful, significant international partnerships can be developed following that. And, and Bill, perhaps on the uh, on the international role of international partnerships. Yes, well, I I, th I think that this is definitely going to be an important uh, uh, an important issue. I mean, one, it's an important issue because of the need to reconcile different countries' actions, just as over carbon taxes and uh, dealing with climate change, the key issue is going to be reconciling everyone's climate taxes to make it not protectionist and not uh, not inhibiting 
of, economic, of international trade or subverting its own objectives, but also, I think, with the supply of tr critical technologies or of critical resources, very often uh, the least secure approach will be, could be to depend solely on a domestic supply source. That is as risky as relying on, on uh, certain foreign ones. So I think that coordination on the investment in new sources of supply of some, some critical resources, coordination on the defense and but also development of critical technologies is going to be, I think, a, a very important uh, part of this. It's always vulnerable to changes of government, which is my, my il illustration of the Trump administration's steel and aluminium approach is also intended to suggest allies may be long term, but the specific governments running them keep changing, uh, and they have different strategies. It's not going to be easy, but I do think that that international approach is going to make it stronger. Thank you, Bill. And in the last, uh, we've got four minutes, so I've got one question that, I, I, uh, that we got from, again, from the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, from Watanabe uh, Tsuneo-san. And again, it, it speaks to the, the, the issue of growth, which I think is uh, we, we've come back to. But I just want to give you another opportunity, Minister, to, to talk about the links between um, economic security and economic growth. Uh, and Watanabe-san says, I'm interested in your statement that economic security has elements of growth strategy in it. Uh, specifically, please could you uh, tell us in what ways you intend to link this to, to, uh, to growth? Prime Minister uh, Kishida's uh, message about um, buy and invest uh, uh, speak to the uh, issue. Uh, in the Kishida administration, uh, economic growth is one of the uh, cornerstones. Uh, there are two reasons. If there is a special circumstance or incident affecting uh, economic growth negatively, that has to be uh, minimized. The negative impact must be uh, minimized to the extent possible. That's the purpose of the economic. That's the purpose of economic security. Another aspect is uh, it, pushing economic growth, propelling economic growth, uh, would be done through public-private partnership, for example, of developing cutting-edge technology. Uh, that framework is now part of the uh, legislation. In that context, uh, it, although it will be, it, it's done through public-private partnership, but this is not closed to other uh, countries or other international enterprises. Obviously, partnerships uh, would be established uh, with international counterparts, especially allies. And uh, that is at the crux of the uh, act. And during the diet deliberation, I made uh, clear that uh, international collaboration would be essential to that effort. And would contribute directly to economic growth. Thank you. Well, we have more questions coming in all the time and uh, very detailed questions. So uh, we're out of time, though. Uh, so uh, but thank you to the audience for being so engaged uh, with, with, this, uh, with this important session. Um, thank you, uh, Minister Kobashi, and thank you, Bill, uh, for this uh, insightful and rich discussion on Japan's uh, economic security strategy, but particular Particularly, thank you, Mr. Minister Kobayashi, for taking the time uh, to speak uh, with us on this, this really critical topic and for off offering your expertise uh, and insights uh, on Japan's pioneering economic security strategy. Kobayashi Daijin, domo arigatou gozaimashita. Uh, and we hope that our audience tuning in from around the world enjoyed this as much as we did here, uh, in person, of course, which is also a treat uh, these days, and in Japan. Um, uh, and a recording will be made available on the IISS website, which is www.iiss.org, uh, within the next 24 hours. And this is the first in a series of economic security webinars that the IISS Japan Chair will be holding. So we'll hopefully see you at the, few, the future uh, webinars as well. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>